We are indeed honored to be included in the Groton monthly programs here. As in the movie theater, first come the credits. <laughs> in the 1960s, Bud Coulson began to collect oral histories from the old timers at Groton Long Point and uh, did, was doing very well with this. And Evelyn Sharple suggested that they be collected and a book produced. And so it happened. Uh, 25 years later, Miss um, Crosby did the same thing, collected more history, and completed a second book. That, that was very productive, and everybody was happy with this. So when the Groton Long Point Women's Organization continued gathering history, uh, all kinds of history, but it was concentrated for a while on the history of houses, identifying each house in Groton Long Point and trying to find the origins of each one. And uh, then Faye Taylor looked at this burgeoning history thing and took it to a new, a new level entirely by joining the New England Archivists, and then by uh, following their very professional procedures of collecting and uh, preserving materials, uh, things did progress to a from a rather an awkward academic, I mean, a level to a really professional level by following very strict procedures and sticking to them. Ray Munn has, uh, with his expertise, has produced the visual portion of the program. Now I'd like to introduce Gloria Gabbard, who is an expert <laughs> an experienced archivist for, for many organizations, including ours. So we're glad to have her here. And she will share with you some of the history of Groton Long Point. Gloria? Thank you. Don't trip over that. No, don't you. There are a lot of cords there. I know. You want that? Carol Kimball was was unable to give her uh, talk, her lecture, on the history of Groton because one of those unlooked for, unwanted snowstorms showed up. However, I understand that it will be given later on, and as a result, I do not want to intrude with my information on what I think she will give you. So I'm going to be give you a very brief background that will lead us to Rotten Long Point, which is the subject of my talk tonight. In 1657, when John Winthrop Jr. became the third governor of Connecticut, King, 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 which King? King Charles, I should remember that. King Charles II deeded to him a large tract of land here in this area. And we can have our first picture of that. You will notice that the circle surrounds the part that is Groton Long Point. He decided to call it his great farm because his view was that he would like to have tenant farmers come from England and take charge of the land. Well, it turned out that Englishmen didn't want to leave their land, so we had to make do with native farmers here. There were 6,000 acres involved in this tract, and it included Pequannock Bridge, 
Fort Hill, Haley Farm, and Bluff Point, and our little Groton Long Point sticking out there. Groton Long Point is initially, or was initially, a sandy peninsula. It wasn't even a mile in length. And it stretched out about that a, a little bit of a mile, and it juts out into the sound. So said that off the coast there, where you see that curve up, it's like a large, wide-mouthed sea creature. And our community is less than a quarter square mile in size. But we have shorelines of two and a half miles that have been very uh, attractive to a number of people. It was probably the land of, of Groton Long Point was probably used for the grazing of cattle and of sheep. There was only one building on that land and it was called the farmhouse. Nope, we got to get go a little further. This is a favorite old picture of mine. It shows the farmhouse in olden days and across the road on what is now called North Street. North Street goes from East Shore up to Duryea Drive is the barn. And in the barn were, of course, housed, I'm sure, the various cattle. And I believe the land of uh, Groton Long Point was used uh, for sheep as well as cattle. You've got to remember there were no trees on Groton Long Point in those days. It was just a lot of seagrass and sand and rocks. We'll get to the rocks later. Um, that barn is sitting on the land right now where our pump house presently stands and also our um, putting green. Then in 1894, five businessmen from New London decided they wanted to purchase that land. They had a bright idea and they purchased it from Chauncey Abbey. The men were Mr. Newcomb, Mr. Sherman, Mr. Perry, Mr. Hislop, and Mr. Armstrong. It turned out that Mr. Perry died soon after, and his executor, by the name of Mr. Duval, um, took over, took his place in the partnership. Mr. Hislop, well, just backed out because he said it reminded him too much of his home in Scotland and it would make him feel unhappy. So that's what he did. So now we're down to four men. Their plan at, plan at first was very grandiose. Um, I think we need to see the, have we got another one of the farmhouse? Can't remember. Yes. No, there should be another one. There. That, of course, is an elegant <laughs> photographer's dream. Um, I don't think it ever looked quite that beautiful, but <laughs> it certainly looks better than the one before. The group decided that what they were going to do was build a hotel on the elevated land that is what we now call Clubhouse Point. Then they were going to have a, um, an amusement park in the area of the large lagoon. And a trolley line, can we have another picture maybe? No, I guess we, oh. No, we'll just leave that for the moment. Um, they were going to have a trolley line come down on the right-hand side of Groton Long Point down to the lagoon and then have the amusement park with all the various, attrap various trappings that go along with an amusement park. Uh, a lot of people said, 
we were saved from being a honky-tonk place. Well, I'm not sure it would have been that bad, but at any rate, the whole plan fell through, and they did not do that. They wanted, of course, then, to, to have lots, and uh, Mr. Dubal was an engineer, and so he laid out a series of lots on the land, and they set to having them sold. But it was difficult to get to Groton Long Point. And uh, so they didn't sell quite as rapidly as they had hoped. I'm going to read you about one trip that came from Hartford down here to Groton Long Point, and it was Charlie Pons. To get there from Hartford, the family carried their bags three blocks to the trolley thence to the station where they boarded a valley branch train down the banks of the Connecticut River to Saybrook, where they changed cars for New London. Then they took the ferry across the Thames River to Groton, and the mystic-bound trolley went through woods and fields to a little shed which stood near the present entrance to the point. There, Mr. Wheeler, the father of our illustrious postmistress, Eliza, um, would lead us on his horse-drawn truck <coughs> and wind a slow way over sandy lanes to the main beach where a little cottage named the Breakers was waiting with no other house nearby. It rented for the princely sum of a hundred dollars a month. It was a three and a half hour trip. And we have some other wonderful stories about how people managed to get here. Now the early deeds when they did sell houses, uh, I shouldn't call them houses, they were really just board and batten cottages, um, had certain restrictions and I'm going to read you a couple of them. And this is from 1916. Quote, there shall not be constructed or maintained upon said property any cow stable, pigsty, or building or business for the manufacture or sale of intoxicating liquor. Unquote. The next quote, all private receptacles for water closets, privies, garbage, or wastewater shall be in the rear of the plot and shall be protected by using iron pails and cleaned weekly." End quote. May we have the um, next one? Ah, that's the one I'm looking for. Here you see, and I'm not sure what that little building is up there. There was a, uh, we understand there was a hermit had a shed or house there once upon a time. But what I really wanted you to see was the barrenness of the land and also all the rocks. Keep the rocks in mind for later <coughs> on. I have something else I want to say about those. The land company's brochure of 1895, after Duball surveyed and plotted lots and planned development of this, quote, summer home by the sea, unquote, the brochure offered fine bathing beaches, one, quote, peculiarly safe for women and children, unquote. Constant sea breezes, crabs and fish galore, and eggs and vegetables and so forth from the farmhouse. I think we have a something on that with show. No. Oh. <laughs> I'm not quite ready for that. I thought I had one uh, that said in here, but it doesn't. People began to buy, but slowly. The cost was as low as $195 a lot. Way out of line, said a lot of people. And that, I think, deterred them from purchasing. Though along about 1911, 
There was built the first cottage, Snug Harbor, on East Shore, close to the entrance of the point. Now, we should have a picture of that. No, I guess we don't. I guess we don't. Something else I want instead. Um, then in 1911, the land company also hired James J. Smith. And he was a very well-known developer. And the purpose of hiring him was to have him market the property. And it was a smart move. J.J. Smith put his office near the entrance, hired two women to help him as agents. To encourage buyers, he convinced the land company to think of providing a water system, a boardwalk, a clubhouse, and other amenities. Do we have a picture of the clubhouse? Ah, there it is. That is the first clubhouse. It's on Clubhouse Point, and uh, tennis courts were built around it. It was surely, of course, for um, social gatherings, and that happened in 1913. And it would bring the early Groton Long Point settlers together. On Saturday nights, dances were held for the old and the young. The old would waltz and the young would do the turkey trot, all to the same music and have a good time. The 4th of July was always celebrated with a big clam chowder fest. And then, as I say, tennis courts were uh, placed nearby. However, they were not of regulation size, but at least people could play tennis. The first rudimentary <coughs> water system was of two-inch galvanized pipes laid along the sides of the road. And unfortunately, every time a truck, or well, I shouldn't call it a, tr a motorized truck, but something the size of a truck or a wagon went over it, they would break. And I think we have a picture of where the water came from. Yes, good. Ooh, that came out well. Um, the water came from a well at the intersection of um, Ridge Road and Prospect Avenue, Prospect Street. And then there was another one um, at Middlefield Street. Each had a pressure tank and pump. Electric power lines extended to the point about 1912, and residents formed the Groton Long Point Club. Land sales did increase as autos, uh, the use of autos was increased. <clears throat> so then J.J. Smith came up with a bright thought. He wanted to promote the lagoon, the one that runs uh, behind West Shore Avenue. He called it the Venetian Yacht Club Harbor Canal. Well, we weren't quite ready for that. <laughs> Building cottages in the summer, and I think we can come up with some other pictures. Yes, oh, I like that one. Uh, people found that they could live in tents on their property and watch their houses being built. And that's what a number of people did, too. They were also enjoying the riches of Groton Long Point. Lots of fish there. But can you imagine taking, getting fish in a business suit and a long dress, long skirted dress? Apparently they did. Then um, we have a picture of a boardwalk cottage. And please note how alone it looks. There weren't many houses on the boardwalk in the 19 teens. But we have some bathing beauties to show you. <laughs> there are a couple. And we have a couple of more. 
<laughs> yes, they're enjoying it. All right, here's the cost of one house in 1913. The bid was $912.05, and that did not include car fare. There also exists an estimated bill for the furnishings, $90.30. All furniture, lamps, china, kitchen utensils, and window shades. Eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> Getting to uh, Groton Long Point improves when a trolley bridge was built over Palmer's Cove in 1915 and then a waiting room where people could stay um, at the entrance to the point. And we have several pictures of that. There's that little house that they could stay, and you will notice the uh, stone pillars that mark the entrance. The next one. Yes, there you see people walking into the point. The, road is still nothing but dirt and you'll see that there's a sign up may we have the next picture yeah i like this next one um, <clears throat> done by barbara rose because it shows you the post entering at the point and the sign i think you can read lots for sale and so on and the price it's a very pretty picture. I think we have a couple of more. Yeah, that, the, the note on that one says, entering the point. Sorry, we think it's meant leaving the point because it doesn't look anything like the entrance to the point. The next one. Yeah, there's our trolley bridge. Uh, that has been all, always one of the big hang-ups in coming to Groton Long Point in the early days. There was no way to get over from Noank to Groton Long Point. And people sometimes going through Haley Farm had a difficult time walking through, I think it's seven gates, and then having to um, stop and open the gate and go through and then close the gate and so forth before they could get anywhere. Um, the next picture, I think, yes, there's that first house, Nug Harbor, uh, that was built on East Shore. And the one whose costs I cited to you. In those days, there were no house numbers. So cottages had names. Panama meant hope. Buena Vista, Salt Air, Wander Inn, and so forth. Mail, however, reached these people with no trouble. Around about 1912, may we have the next picture? Um, the first boardwalk was built. Well, where did where'd this come from? Well, I never saw that before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we've done this, let's go on. Yes, there I am. It's the boardwalk I wanted. You'll notice the way in which the um, boards are laid. And I have a feeling there must have been an awful lot of splinters into bare feet uh, coming up from those boards. That boardwalk was 10 feet wide and a half a mile long. Then, when it was replaced in 1923, I think we have a picture of that one. You can see that the boards were laid the other way, which I think was much more comfortable for people. Do we have another? No, I guess those are the two. So, J.J. Smith was getting all his earlier suggestions fulfilled. I'd like to read a part of one of his hard sell ads, though, pushing to get the, um, the place filled up. And the ad reads this way, part of it. You cannot afford it. 
plots 50 by 125 feet from $195 upward, 10% down, and the balance in 2% monthly payments. If you're hard up, we allow you to miss your payments for six <laughs> months or more. Or so, so you can't lose your lot. Come on down. Let us drive you around. And if you do not find the property exactly as represented, we will pay your fare. <laughs> About as much as one could do, I guess. Well, of course, World War I did slow the growth. And also the interest in people coming to Groton Long Point. But it revived after the war. By 1921, there were about 150 cottages at the point. We needed a governmental structure with more statutory authority than the Groton Long Point Club possessed. We gained the Groton Long Point Association Charter in 1921. We also built, had built a casino. Now let me clarify this for you. According to Webster's most recent dictionary, a casino is a place for social enjoyment. The second meaning of casino is as a gambling unit. Well, our casino has always meant and been the first definition. <coughs> but we do get into a lot of trouble now that we have two casinos in our area and people don't quite understand our use of the play name. The original clubhouse was sold and it was moved and it's now a private dwelling. This new casino, oh, can we have the casino? We haven't seen that yet. Uh oh, I didn't mean to get him in there. Well, let me tell you about him. And you just keep in mind, this is Ernest Duke Duhame, Duhame, rather, and this is his swim and diving group. And I will tell you about him in a little bit. What comes next? Nope. Oh dear, we got Uncle Mutt's gang. That we're going to hear about too. I'm looking for the casino. Hmm? It, comes later. it comes later. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I wanted to tell you though that the casino. Oh. Yeah, there it is. I knew we had it somewhere. <laughs> um, that's a, my problem. I should have thought that through. The casino held the post office and it held the grocery store, it held a luncheonette. Uh, also, meeting rooms of considerable size so that the, the members of Groton Long Point could meet or the board. At other times, we've had a beauty parlor there. We've had a gift shop. Um, we've had a real estate office. So it varies over time. With the charter in place, the 1921 charter, the association could have authority over a number of problems. Among them was disrobing on the beach or wearing immodest clothing. I wonder what people would say today if they could have seen ahead. Um, and other problems. The 20s was a busy time. As you know, prohibition was in effect. And Prohibition ran from 1921 to 1933. And you had rum runners uh, seeking ways to get uh, their liquor to our shores. And Groton Long Point had a number of inlets and spots where this could be done. And I'm going to tell you just one of the stories. There was a family that had a cottage on the lagoon. Directly across the lagoon was another friend by the name of Bill who had his cottage. 
but his was on uh, the far side. One winter, Bill came down to check on his cottage, and he looked across the lagoon and he saw a light in his friend's house. And he thought, ah, oh, he's here to check his cottage too. So he got in his car and he drove around to say hello. In the yard, however, was a big trailer truck and a man standing alongside with a shotgun. Bill was told to be still and all would be okay. At the dock, Bill saw four boats abreast with people loading cases of liquor onto the truck. Bill was made to sit there until the truck drove off. At least he wasn't harmed. Uh, we also know that uh, there were rum runners that were built, many of them, in Mystic. And they were used to meet the big boats that were out beyond the five mile limit and take the uh, cargo of liquor and then bring it to the shores here. In 1931, the Groton Long Point Association bought all the assets of the Groton Long Point Land Company. The association in the 30s used to issue ID stickers for cars. They built tennis courts near the casino. They prohibited the sale of liquor the Water Commission was established and water pipes were laid to the Groton Reservoir. The Depression caused some lots to be sold, or had to be repossessed, of course, and then sold. But there was one success. Finally, a concrete bridge was built over Palmer's Cove. Now, let me see if we got a picture of that. Wait a minute. All right. I think this is a good point at which I can talk about these people. You've seen something about oh, one of them, Duke Duhame. I've cho we've had many, many people here that we remember very fondly. Some of them are eccentric. We like them for their eccentricity. Some for their generosity, for the things they did for Groton Long Point. But I'm only going to tell you about three, primarily because they had given their time and their energy to the young people of Groton Long Point. And the first one is Duke DeHaim. Can we get back to him? I'm not sure we can. Yes. He was a young man who absolutely, everybody said, I've never known anybody so organized. And he was a highly organized. He trained, and you can see the ages vary from little kids up to big kids. He trained his swimming team and his diving teams, and they entered into um, competition with others. And um, I have other things I want to say about him. He also, um, let me see, where am I here? I lost it. Uh, let me find this here. He had, he formed volleyball teams, he had boxing matches, he had foot races, um, he had treasure hunts to Bluff Point, and lots more. The kids thought of him as their idol. The parents called him the king of the kids, and he did much for those children. He was only an undergraduate at the University of Miami at the time. He also was one of our lifeguards. Then you should hear about Uncle Mutt. Can we pick him up? No? 
There he is. That's his gang. Now, this man's name was Morton Hull. He came from Holyoke, Massachusetts, and he was a wholesale grocer. When he came to the point, he brought down great collection of lollipops, penny candy, uh, you name it. And uh, he kept, um, and bubblegum, we mustn't forget bubblegum. And he would have what he called in his living room his handout store. Every day, children could come after lunch or after supper and come for a handout. They would politely say, Uncle Mutt, please may I have a handout? If successful, the child would say, thank you, Uncle Mutt. I'm sure the parents enjoyed having them learn a few manners. But if the papers from these candies were found strewn all over the shoreline, and a lot of them were, and the child was caught and the police helped in this situation, they had to appear at Saturday morning in the basement of Uncle Mutt's house for court. And the worst penalty of all was to have no candy for a week. It didn't take long to keep those kids uh, putting their papers where they belonged. Now the last thing I want to talk, the last one I want to speak about is Sid Burr. The minute you say the name, most people smile. <laughs> he taught everyone at Groton Long Point how to swim. And he did it from his dock in the lagoon. It said, it is said that 40,000 children put their 40,000 faces in the water for the first time at the command of Sid Burr's voice as it echoed up and down the lagoon. Now, he did all this while standing on his dock. And not many people ever saw him get his feet wet. <laughs> and I've never heard of anyone who had. <laughs> he also, in addition, built a sports field on Atlantic Avenue. And he did it primarily by himself, digging up the land and taking out the rocks and so on. He did have some help, uh, finally. And now somebody said to him, why you work so hard to do this? He said, just because I like Groton Long Point. And those are the three men that I've chosen. I can tell you there are plenty of women on this list too, but we haven't time to hear all of our so-called special people. All right, then we have the hurricane of 1938. And it was the worst hurricane of the century. Yes. It slammed into the coast of Connecticut, or at Groton Long Point, I should say, on September 21, 1935. And it came in at high tide. 1938, what am I saying? <laughs> Yeah, I put the wrong number down. Um, high tide in the afternoon with winds that were then 100 miles an hour. And they were going to get worse. And they had storm surges that battered everything in its path. Fred Clark, who really was known as Mr. Rotten Long Point, because he'd been on the point since he was a child. He'd worked there as a, as a youngster. And he had a great love of the area. He built up a construction business, and he did the trash collection business, and then he even had a real estate um, office later on. He went around trying to secure shutters and garage doors, but it just got too bad for him to keep it up. Then he wanted to go and get his daughter who was in Noank at the uh, Noank Grammar School. He couldn't get over the bridge. The water had already um, surged highly over that. 
he found a car stalled in the water on Sound Breeze near East Shore Avenue. The water was already a foot deep. The driver was a woman and she had two women friends with her. He tried to talk the three of them into coming with him and seeing if his truck couldn't get them onto higher ground. They refused. They said they were going to stay with the car. He looked back at one point and saw the Bryant and Chapman milk truck drive up, who also tried to urge the women to come out of their car and join and get to higher ground. Again, they refused. Fred saw the wave that washed the car into the marsh, hurling it 200 feet. Of course, the three women drowned. Those three plus one woman on the boardwalk are the four casualties from the 38 hurricane. Meanwhile, his wife Cornelia, who uh, was in their home on Beach Road, and their home was far enough in so that though they had water climb climbing into their basement, the house was not bothered. They brought upstairs all the canned goods because Fred was bringing in people who needed aid, and other people were seeking aid at their place. And they had something over 30 people, plus a young mother with her 12-day-old baby and they took care of them as best they could while this hurricane continued to rage. There are many of the 38 hurricane stories. Probably each one of the senior citizens can tell us a lot about them. But we'll just um, cite the story of, can we have some pictures of the hurricane? There's your casino looking pretty, pretty sad. Next. That is the, I wanted you to notice this one in particular. This is, is the restored casino. They managed to get it built the next year in time for the annual meeting. However, notice it has only three steps up. Can we have another picture? We had to take that one, uh, we had to raise it. We raised it 40 inches because there was no way that that uh, casino was going to be able to survive another tremendous flood. All right, so let's have some more. Yes, it's one of the damages from the 38 hurricane. And another. Now, this building is not a wall. It's on its side. They are lying on top of a building. Another one? Yes. Pretty messy. And more, the boardwalk. All right. This is Land's End, and we want to talk about this because this is where J.J. Smith built his cottage. He wanted to build it on top of the rocks so that he could fish from there. Let's, but the hurricane came and swept it out. The next one. You can see it demolished. <coughs> and then the area today. You can see a little, if you, if you go there, it's the end of Weston Avenue, you can see a little of the, um, yeah, <laughs> what's the word I want? Foundation. Underpinnings. <laughs> and uh, otherwise you're just seeing rocks. So the sort of ironic in a way that his was so completely, completely demolished. The man who spent so much time selling this place. Um, what do we, oh yeah. Yes, boathouse or houseboat. Okay, let me see where I'm at now. All right. I think we've got a picture of the jazz band coming up. Nope, nope, not yet. Yes, we do. Good. 
All right. This is the group at the uh, casino. It's made up of young young people from the point, and I think so. Yeah, there you are. It's right. <laughs> I wondered if he'd see himself. <laughs> of course, that's Jim Quinn. Okay, and the next one. Yes. No, I wanted you to notice that the in the dance band, notice the girl. That was Bessie Tyler Brooke, right? And she was allowed to join them because she could play the violin. And so they needed her. So those were the two bands that we had. Okay, now, what else? Uh, I want also to talk about the lagoon. Have you got a picture of the lagoon? We have that next. Ah, good. The lagoon was a, I don't know, albatross in a way. Uh, you could not bring boats in. It had those two um, sort of islands. They were mucky and they were yuck. And we did have a story of a carpenter who said he would bet a week's wages he could swim across. He did it, but he didn't enjoy it. And so what happened is they finally, in 1937, decided, this is before the hurricane, to clear the um, lagoon of those two so-called islands so that then people, and to use the stuff that they dug out of the lagoon to build houses on, and so people could bring their boats in and anchor their boats where their houses uh, or their cottages were um, set. Then in 19, yeah, that was after, in 1950, oh, that's the, um, which one is that? that hmm? The same one, yeah. Um, then in 1954, the small lagoon, or what we call the inner lagoon, was cleared. And what it is uh, done, it, it's used for teaching youngsters sailing, or the techniques, or the, begin the rudiments of sailing. And we've also had maroon made uh, to have re uh, regulation tennis courts and they were built nearby. Okay. Then we had an, um, we had a big heated controversy in 1969. Some people got the idea, and I think you can show us the next picture. No. Where did that, how'd that get in there? That's all right. I love this picture anyway. It shows the um, wooden bridge that was built over the lagoon at the um, sound end in the early days so that people could get in and out a little bit at any rate. It's a wonderful bridge. And I think it went out with the hurricane. And that was the end of that. What else have we got? Ah, all right, this is what I wanted. Our heated issue I'm talking about. Should we develop, was the question, a new lagoon in the marsh between Atlantic Avenue and Island Circle? We could make a new waterway, build retaining walls, and reclaim land as house lots. The argument was more land, more people, more income, more tax money. It was voted down. You want to show the area, the next one? And the Conservation Commission was established. And you can see in the upper part what has been saved. This Conservation Commission, by the way, is still very active. 
It cleaned up, the members of it, cleaned up the area, making trails to walk. And there's a self-guided self tour booklet that you can pick up and you can follow those trails. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the archives. Uh, Helen has told you that we are quite professional. We do use archive boxes and we do use um, mylar sleeves to put things away. And we do some interesting things. One of them was one day somebody was working on the houses and said, you know, I wonder if we have any more of those stone fireplaces. I bet you we've got six of them. And because I happen to have one in my house, I said, eh, maybe 16. So we sent the word out and we were <laughs> the deluge with people saying, we've got them. And it was wonderful because people let us come to their home. One of our members, who's very good at taking pictures, um, took pictures of the fireplaces. And you want to put them up, or one set of them up, okay, uh, for us, took pictures of them. And it's turned out we have over 65 still here on the point. And I suspect there are several more than the 65. But I want you to see that there are two types. This is one type. This is called beach stone. The stones used have been washed and washed and washed by the ocean for many years. And there's a soft look to them. And there's a rounded look to them. And they're very lovely. And so we have a number of the, the beach stone fireplaces here on the point. The other type, which is the kind I have, are the rough hewn stone. And we've got plenty of it here at Groton Long Point. And we have had now, yeah, here's another one. They're wonderful in their own right also. And I think we feel very lucky that we still have that kind of fireplace. And as some of you know, because we got a lot of Groton Long Point people here tonight, we still have a lot of stones on our property, some of them bigger than we like, but we wouldn't move them. All right, I want to tell you the various um, groups that Groton Long Point works with, with the town of, um, town of Groton. And here are, that you can read them for yourself, Board of Assessment Appeal, Conservation Commission, Economic Development Commission, Permanent School Building Committee, Planning Commission, Representative and Town Meeting, Town Political Committee, both Republican and Democrat. To wind up as a kind of summary, <coughs> I'm going to read you something that Joe Devine wrote when he made his 1971 uh, oral history. Joe Devine was used to being on the point from the time he was a child. He also served as our president for 15 years, from 1966 to 1981. And this is something that he said. After being away, there is no finer sight that from the slope down Groton Long Point Road, Fisher's Island Sound opens to view, then a curve, and then the entrance pillars. There is no more beautiful sight on earth. And I think a lot of us still feel that way. Thank you for coming. <laughs>